Good morning, Hollyview. Um, we are excited to be here today. You know, the last couple of weeks, well, the last several months have been pretty heavy. Um, watching the news and everything else that's been going on, we wanted to start with, and we are shamelessly ripping it off from someone else, we wanted to start with some good news this morning. And so um, that's how we wanted to open our time. Our first good news is that we're here. So no, we don't have everybody here, but we still have people walking in, and it's just exciting. Um, we got up and we got to get dressed. We didn't have to <laughs> just straggle in in our PJs to watch it on a TV screen. Um, so we're not there yet, but we're taking some steps, and that's some good news. And some other good news is the construction that's going on around here. It's really coming together and pretty super excited about that. The basement is uh, is on the home stretch. So carpet will be going in in a week, about seven days. Um, and then we'll be able to move back into that space and super excited for everybody to see that and use it. Uh, really going to be a nice uh, space update. So excited about that and uh, just can't wait till we all gather and can, can uh, see it and invest in it and, and be happy that we, we have it. So, In other good news, um, our youth have been able to start to get together and see one another face to face. Um, they are, quote, over the Zoom meetings, and so which we all are. Um, so it's been really good. Um, on Friday nights, we've been getting together and using the fire pit and playing some good socially distanced games and then having time around the fire pit. So we will be doing that again this Friday from 7 to 9. Um, and then directly after service, um, we're inviting the youth to come and um, bring your lunch or a snack, and we're going to um, have our normal, what we normally did kind of for Sunday school prior to service, we're now doing that after. So that's happening today as well. And then some of you probably saw on Facebook and things that have been going around about Pastor Joel, but he's been here a year. And today starts, <laughs> today is the, the first Sunday of his second year with us. So that is fantastic, fun, exciting news. So it's a, it's a new year for Joel at, with all of you. And for us as our family, our good news um, Today is June 7th, and that became a um, new date for us to celebrate three years ago. This is the last day that Stephen um, got chemotherapy three years ago. So this is the date that they yeah. So this is the date that they mark for his remission. So he is three years into remission, and we're just really excited to celebrate that as a family. So we just wanted to take some time and pray over some of the things. We, we got one thing to pray over that came in. Um, I know there's other things on your hearts and concerns and things that have happened in this world. Um, and it's just been uh, it's been a rough couple months. So let's just come take a time to pray, and uh, then we'll get the service uh, turned over to Joel. Lord, let's pray. Uh, Lord, we just thank you so much for who you are and what you do and, and how you um, hold all peace and all control of all things, um, even though we can't always see it, Lord. Um, but we can stop and see these bits and pieces of good news and are excited about that, Lord. We pray that your spirit is moving on this planet, that you are um, moving in the hearts of those that follow you, that we may point others to the hope that we have in you, Lord, that um, there is a better way to um, enjoy one another and um, um, uphold each other, Lord, for uh, the relationships that you meant us to have, um, where we look after one another and care for one another, not tear one another down, Lord. Lord, uh, I just praise you for all these uh, bits of good news. Um, I also want to stop and pray for Carol and her, her friend, um, Carla, as she uh, continues to um, battle her struggle with cancer, Lord, and that you, um, you just be with her as she um, goes back to the hospital for some more testing, Lord. Um, we just thank you and, and praise you and uh, look forward to the message and the worship time this morning, Lord, that we can pause, reflect on you, and um, 
allow that to fill us and recharge us for a week ahead. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Crovers. It's fun having people here. Thank you for coming. I'm excited. And you're at home, uh, hopefully not too much longer. Um, we don't actually know what we're doing next week. But then again, when do we ever really know, right? We kind of live in an illusion that we think we have everything planned out, but we're just walking by faith. Uh, so as the details come out, uh, even this week, some things changed from faith gatherings of 100 people or less to 250 people or less. So 150 people changed like overnight, and I'm not quite sure who decided it or when, uh, but we're just going to we'll walk, uh, keep walking by faith in that, and we'll let you know best we can. We're trying the best we can to communicate and make sure you know uh, all that stuff. Um, we, do, we don't have just things for youth, though. Uh, on Wednesday at 3 o'clock and 7 o'clock, we have uh, a time we smaller groups getting together, uh, pray for each other, share a little bit, um, and we're looking at the book of Psalms. So if you were there this week and uh, you know, like, I'm pumped up about the book of Psalms. That's like one of my favorite books. So even if you just want to come and see Joel get excited, that would, that's, a, that's a good reason. That's a good reason to do that. A year. Yeah, it's a year. I can't believe it's been a year. Uh, I'm getting older uh, in the year that um, that was from last year. Uh, I, I don't normally wear glasses, um, but a couple years ago, uh, I was diagnosed with uh, an, a, a an astigmatism, if you know what that is. So they just say, you don't really need them, but if at nighttime, if your eyes are tired or whatever. Actually, uh, a long time ago when I was 18, I was in a car accident, and I broke... Uh, this eye socket bone. So uh, as it broke, this eye set back uh, like a millimeter from this eye. So my eyes are actually, that's why I look weird. So in case you're wondering. <laughs> so it sets back just a little bit. But they said when you're young, your eyes will be able to adjust. They're strong enough they'll be able to adjust. But as you get older, um, you might have start problems and needing, needing glasses. So I went in a few years ago and they said, uh, you know, number one, number two, number one, number two. And I was like, oh, uh, I actually put these on and things seem like crystal clear. It's not that I actually need them, but uh, and I, I kind of think it's probably the accident that caused that, not me getting older, because um, I'm. <laughs> Somebody said sorry. Uh, yeah, well, it's uh, you know some, sometimes uh, we think we see clearly, and then we get something put in front of us, and then we're like, oh, maybe I wasn't seeing that clearly, and maybe I am seeing. Uh, clearer now than I was before. The problem with me, and I have to admit, it's not just my eyesight. My, my eyes are actually uh, fairly well. I don't need these. Uh, it's not just my eyesight, though, that I'm not 20-20 vision in. I um, often do premarital counseling or pre-engagement counseling for couples, uh, and I was read a lot on that. I was given a book a couple years ago uh, called uh, Created for Connection, and I was reading this book just to sharpen my skills to be able to help uh, younger people as they're entering marriage or even in just relationships. And as I was reading this uh, book, I came to a chapter that was describing uh, pretty much me. Now, I'm reading this book to help other people because I'm, I can see, boy, their marriage is really hurting. They could really use a tune-up. Uh, but for me, I, I wasn't reading this book to think about me. But as I'm reading this chapter and going, man, this is this is describing me to a T. And then it said in the book, I remember uh, I read a lot uh, on a treadmill. So I remember exactly where I was and even which treadmill as I'm reading the chapter describing me. And it gets to the point and says, and if you're reading this and this is your personality, you are probably completely blind to your part in this situation. And I'm like, well, no, that's, I can see clearly. Uh, and as it went on to describe, I just felt, uh, convicted, embarrassed, going, what? This, no. I mean, for 10 plus years of marriage, I've been doing the same thing, and I thought I was doing the right thing. And it was like reading that and discovering that I wasn't seeing clearly. It was like, like I found a rotten banana peel underneath the couch after 10 years of like, oh, has this really been here the whole time? Why didn't I see that? Why didn't I smell that? Why, what is something? And at that moment, I had the choice of what I was going to do. I had seen myself. I had seen a, a blind spot 
uh, that I had never seen before. I thought I was doing the right thing, uh, but when I was confronted and I could see clearly, uh, I could, one, I could defend myself and go, well, it's just my background, it's how I grew up, it's what I learned, this is just who I am. Uh, I could rationalize it and go, well, really, if she hadn't have done this, then I wouldn't have done this. And so really, it's, it is her fault. Or, or I could humble myself, or humble myself and go, yeah, may, maybe I'm not seeing all that clearly in this issue. And repent uh, and go to Amy and go, boy, uh, I've really messed up in some areas. Um, so that, that is what I did. Not, not every time do I do that, but this time I felt so convicted. I went home and told Amy all about it and said, look, this describes me perfect, doesn't it? And she's like, yeah, it does. I couldn't see it. And I, and I, I had to apologize. I said, I'm so, I'm so sorry I, that I've never seen this. It was like I was blind, but now I can see. And I am sorry I've I've treated you in this way. Uh, I, 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 want, I want to see that in the future. I don't want to do that uh, in the future. Um, and if, if, this is just an aside, if, if you're interested in that or, or you're like, boy, I'd love to know these, it's, it's a book of attachments, how we attach to one another in relationships and what happens when those relationships are, are stressed with each other, when we all respond differently trying to do the same thing. So if you're interested in that, let me know. That's not what this sermon's about, but it's super fascinating. Uh, we're actually going to be continuing our study in the Gospel according to Matthew in chapter 21, if you have your Bibles. Um, and Jesus is going to uh, come to some Pharisees. And these Pharisees, uh, much like me, are blind to their own sin and weakness. And Jesus will gently lead them to be able to see, to see their, their own sin. Uh, these Pharisees were great at looking at other people and going, ah, boy, Josh, if you could do this, you would be a much better person. But in their own life, they couldn't see any of it. There was blurred vision until Jesus comes and puts these glasses on them, uh, has them uh, see in a mirror who they really are and their imperfections and sin. And so that's what Jesus is going to do for us this morning as well as we look at this chapter. He's going to lead us to see clearly three things. So this is going to be the outline for, as we look at and read this chapter too. Uh, he's going to put these glasses on so that we can see three things. See your own blindness. The own spots where you're like, I never saw that before. And I didn't want to look at it. And, and, and then it's going to kind of reveal some ugliness in you, in each of us. But he's also going to show us God's glory. And how God, even in the mess of uh, our lives, our own personal lives, our culture, our country, is weaving together this beautiful story so we can see God's glory in all of it. And then the last thing he's going to lead us to see is there's an opportunity to respond. When you see clearly, you, you can do something about it. But that's going to take uh, humility in each of us. Uh, so we're picking up our, in the Gospel of, uh, according to Matthew, last week we, we took a pause and we looked at the Pentecost because uh, I think that, that day is so important uh, for the Christian calendar and for us to remember. Uh, but as we, as we pick it back up, we're going to look at the end of Matthew 21, the last part of the chapter. Uh, the first part of the chapter, you might remember, we, I preached on Palm Sunday. It's the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. It's the last week of Jesus' life. He uh, gets this donkey. He's heading into Jerusalem, and they're waving these branches and putting them before him and crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The king is finally here. And he comes into Jerusalem, and he goes to the temple, and that's where we have the interaction with the Pharisees, these religious uh, elites. These people that think uh, they've gotten their Sunday dress, their best dress on, they, they're looking good, they have all the answers, they think they are seeing pretty clearly everything, and Jesus is going to say, yeah, you might look good, but you've got some real blind spots. You might say the right things and do the right things, but Jesus comes and says, uh, you're not quite there yet. Look at, look at God and respond to him. He gives them these glasses to see clearly. So before we uh, d read the scripture, um, let, me, let me pray for all of us because we'll, we'll need glasses on our hearts this morning. So, Lord, thanks that we can gather together again. It is nice um, hearing even chatter and noise and not just the hollowness of a building. And I know the church is never... Um, 
never been closed, but Lord, it's, it's great to be together, those of us who, who can. And Lord, I pray that in the weeks and months ahead, as we continue down this path of regathering, that we would do it wisely and safely. We give glory and honor to you in our community, for those who are watching, our friends and neighbors that see us, would see us um, concerned with the needs of other people, um, that we would be humble and patient, and we just give grace upon grace to other people. And Lord, as we look at the, the scripture today, Lord, there's so much in our world that we want to judge and we want to see the negative and the sin of everyone around us. And Lord, help us this morning to have eyes to see where we're at with you. Have, have eyes to see where our blind spots are. Give us ears open to hear what you'd want us to hear. And Lord, soften our hearts that will respond to the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you want to turn to Matthew 21, we're going to start in verse 23. 21, 23. This is Jesus has just come into Jerusalem and he encounters the Pharisees. And they say this in verse 23. And when he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him. And as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? They're automatically challenging Jesus. Hey, we're judging you. So let us uh, give us some evidence. Why, uh, why are you coming into Jerusalem as the coming king? They don't see their own failures, their, their own sin, their own brokenness. They're, they're judging other people. And so Jesus is going to come and he's going to give them two stories. So we're going to look at these two stories this morning. We're going to skip ahead, look at verse 28. We'll read 28 to, to the end. Uh, what do you think? This is what Jesus is telling the Pharisees. Uh, put your thinking caps on. Uh, I, want, I want you to see something here. Uh, a man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. Go clean your room. <laughs> and he answered, I will not. But afterwards, he changed his mind and went. He went to the other son and said the same thing. Go clean your room. And he said, I'll go, sir. But he did not go. So Jesus said, which, which of the two did the will of the Father? The Pharisees answered, the first one. Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, the tax collectors and prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterwards change your minds and believe him. Here, another parable. You can't see that first one, where you're at in that first one. Let me give you another one. Uh, here, another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the seasons for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what, do you, what will he do to those tenants? What do you think, Pharisees? Well, they said to him, Wow, he's going to put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to another tenant who will give him the fruit in their seasons. Jesus replied to them, Have you never read the Scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parable, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. May God bless his reading of his word. Jesus tells the Pharisees two stories. 
two stories of vineyards, of all things. Uh, not creative, just two of the same stories. Let's use a, a vineyard as a background. The first one is of two sons, and the first son says, uh, no, I'm not going to do it, but then goes, you know what, I should probably do it, and goes and does it. And the other son goes, uh, I will do it, but just sits there and doesn't do anything. The Pharisees judge, hey, the first son, he was doing the will of the father. Even though he started off bad, changed his mind, and did the will of the father. That's the good one. And then he tells them the other story of a vineyard again, uh, of leasing it out to tenants. And, they, and the owner is just sending back servants just to collect a portion uh, of the fruit that he's set up so marvelously for these tenants. Just a little bit of it. And they kill one. They stone one. They're just abusing everything. And finally, the, tenant, the, the owner is like, I'll send my son. Surely they'll give him some of the fruit. But they're like, no, out of their greed and, and just the lust for more, they, they end up killing the son too. Now, both of these, these stories, if you'll notice, the religious leaders, uh, it, as long as it wasn't about them, they could see very clearly. They, they judged the characters in each of those stories correctly. They could see the sinful behavior of the son that said, yes, I'll go, but didn't go. They can see the sinful behavior of the, the, the tenants who were leasing the vineyard that killed the servants and the son. They were right on. They could see it clearly. They were a good judge of character in others. It was almost like they could see a fly of a sin on the back of a horse, but they couldn't see anything about themselves. So Jesus is in Jerusalem, right? He's riding a donkey. He comes in, talks to these religious uh, elites, and he tells them, uh, let, me tell you, uh, let me tell you a couple stories. Let's say mm, of a vineyard. Leaders of Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, and Jesus is telling a story of a vineyard. Now, if they were truly able to see, they would have even seen the backdrop of this vineyard to people in Jerusalem should have already started their eyes going, uh-oh, this is not going to go well for us. He tells two stories of a vineyard on purpose. In the Hebrew Bible, Bible our Old Testament, the city of Jerusalem and God's people the people of Judah were often spoken of as a vineyard. You can see it through all the prophets. I'm just going to give you one example. This is a, this is a, a famous song and poem in Israel's history. It comes from the, the prophet Isaiah. It says this, Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved have a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones, and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it, and hewed out a wine vat in it. You guys hearing some similarities? And he looked for, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes, sour grapes, grapes you couldn't eat. So then he says, and now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem, my vineyard, and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. A, a song about a vineyard that was prepared, planted, uh, protected by the Lord. A watchtower. Everything they needed was on that fertile hill that they could produce fruit. And the Lord just gives it to them. Here you go. I've prepared all this for you. Would you just walk in my ways? Here's everything you need. But when it came time for the fruit to be harvested... They only got sour grapes. You couldn't even eat these grapes. So the Lord goes on in Isaiah and tells him what he's going to do with his vineyard. He says, I have to clear it out. I have to remove everything to replant and to re-harvest so that the grapes that we get will be, will be delicious, will be what I'm hoping for, will be nourishing and attracting to everyone around them. Jesus comes to Jerusalem, to the leaders of Jerusalem, and tells them a couple stories about a vineyard. You're that vineyard. He told these stories to their great-great-great-grandfathers before they were taken captive to Babylon and said, look, you're not seeing your sin. If you would just see it and return and, and repent and come unto me, then 
then the fruit would be like raised up in you for other people. But because you don't see, because the prophets come and you kill them, because the prophets come and you stone them, I'm going to take that away from you. So he takes those people uh, captive in Babylon. And now Jesus is here in Jerusalem, the same place, speaking to the great, great, great grandchildren of the same people going, let me tell you a story of a vineyard. You know this story. You're in the exact spot. Would you turn and see how blind you are? We sent the prophets. You have the Hebrew Bibles. I sent John the Baptist to prepare the way. And what did you do to him? You killed him. And you're going to kill me too, Jesus says. Because of your blindness, because of your greed, because of the sin, you're going to kill me. How blind you are. You're so great at seeing the sin in other people and judging everyone. You can see clearly, but in your own life, you're completely blind. So this brings us to a place where I think all of us should stop and consider, can we see our sin clearly? Can, can you see your own blindness? Hard to know, right? Because it's, blind, like it's your blindness. So how can you see your own blindness? I, I mean, I'd love, to, I'd love to know. Well, I'm, let me illustrate this uh, for you. A couple uh, weeks ago, it was probably about a month ago, uh, my hair was getting long, and so I had uh, Hannah and Abigail cut my hair. Do you remember that? I should even showed a picture of it. Really cool. Well, uh, afterwards, we're like, well, I don't know if you, you want the back of your neck rounded or flat. And I'm like, I don't know, whatever the hairstylist normally, or barber or whatever normally does. And so um, we get out, and I'm about to reveal something that I have never revealed to anyone. So this is going to, I'm trusting you guys. Uh, Amy gets a, a mirror out, and, so, and I look in the mirror like once a morning for a couple minutes, uh, but she gets another mirror out, wait, <laughs> another mirror out, and shows me the back of my head, and I'm telling you, you can ask Amy. I was shocked. I'm like, wait, that's my, no, uh, I don't know if you noticed, I'm starting to go bald. <laughs> Has anyone seen that? Or I just saw it for the first time. A couple weeks ago. Now, here's the thing. I'm actually really good at seeing other people's bald spots. I see them all the time. Ah, somebody's someone's going, starting to go bald. Ha ha. Uh, Josh, you're OK. Uh, I'll let you know, though. <laughs> but really, honestly, the first time in like a month, I'm like, oh, my goodness, I am going bald. But I could not see it. I needed somebody's help, and I needed a mirror. Uh, and another mirror, actually two mirrors, to be able to see my bald spot. I have no problem seeing the baldness of others, but the baldness, my own bald spot, I have a problem seeing. I needed help, I needed a mirror. In the same way, everyone's checking there. <laughs> In the same way, uh, spiritually, we all have bald spots, blind spots, that we need mirrors to help us see, that we just can't look and go, oh, yeah, I think I'm totally fine. We can't imagine the back of our head. I thought my back of my head was mucho guapo, but it is not so. <laughs> I was telling Amy, you have to look at that? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that doesn't look nice at all. There's even like a patch that's gone. You probably all noticed this, but I'm just finding this out. <laughs> so let me give you three mirrors for blind spots or bald spots in your own spiritual life. We, we all think we hold the ultimate theology. We can judge everything, what's going on in the world, so great, and yet we can be so blind to our own selves. So we need these three mirrors. Here they are. The first one's the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, when I go away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you, and one of his roles is going to be to convict the world of sin. So how does he do that? How does he convict the world of sin? And I'll tell you, uh, I think it's that pit in your stomach when you know you've done something wrong. It's the feeling that as you're doing something, and is somebody looking over my shoulder? It's the feeling when you come into a church service like this and you know you've screwed up this week and going, oh, I bet everyone can tell. It's the spirit with a flashlight in your life looking around saying, what is it that you're trying to hide 
It's that feeling that when a cop car is behind you and you're like, am I going the speed limit? <laughs> well, how do you know if, that, if that's the Holy Spirit pointing out a sin or, or a stubborn part in your life? I think there's a couple ways to tell. If, if there's an area where somebody approaches you on and you're super quick to defend or justify or, nope, that's not me. Like, like it's an injured spot that you don't want anyone to see, and you're trying to, to hide it. If it's something that you don't want to tell other people about, it's probably the Holy Spirit going, I'm bringing light to that. Bring it out. I want to, I want to let you be free. Uh, if it's an area where you don't want to listen to somebody, you're not even open for conversation, nope, don't even talk to me about that. Maybe that's an area that, that there's some sin down deep, and you're trying to cover it or defend it. Maybe, this may be the Holy Spirit is shining a light on something in your life, even now, and you're like, can Joel tell? <laughs> no, I can't, but the Holy Spirit can, and he wants to free you and bring you out of that. But it's not always that feeling. So, so, so feelings can be pretty um, nebulous. You're like, ah, is that the, from the Spirit or, or not? Because sometimes we carry shame and guilt. When, when the Lord's forgiven us and set us free and we keep carrying that, uh, and the Lord's like, no, you've let that go. I've taken that for you. So, so how do you know if it's from the Holy Spirit convicting sin? And I would say it's just like me looking in a mirror and seeing my blind spot. I, I can see what I am, but I actually need another mirror to see the mirror uh, that they kind of come in and like, what is that? In partnership together to be able to see. And that other thing, that other mirror that we have is the Word of God. Uh, we can rationalize and defend, defend our sin better than anyone else. Uh, you can, I can. But the Word of God is like this ruler that we set beside our lives that goes, mm, you're, you're off just a little bit in this area. Your response to that person, was that out of grace or was that out of just you being right and anger? Uh, was, was that jealousy that sparked up in you, was that something from me? Mm, probably not. The Bible gives us that, that line, that standard, that ruler that we can put our lives up next to. And so if you're feeling something that's coming out of you in the Holy Spirit, uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to go to the Word and say, how does this line up with what God says? What's the Bible say about anger? Does he say it's okay as long as you're justified? Oh, I'm just expressing my feelings. But if we look at the mirror, the word of God, there, it doesn't give us excuses. It actually shows those blind spots, those bald spots in our lives where the Holy Spirit's trying to reveal to us. And then the last thing is we, we need a, the, the third mirror is the, is the feedback of a good friend. This is hard. <laughs> Uh, the feedback of a good friend, a, a friend who has the Holy Spirit in them, who can see from the Word of God and line up your, your life as well, and, and can give you trusted feedback that knows they want your best in mind. They're not trying to dog you. They're not trying to push you down. They're actually trying to free you and bring you up. Amy knew I had a bald spot long before I ever did. And if I would have told her, uh, hey, how's my hair doing? She could have told me graciously and gently, yeah, it's starting to get thin back there. I think it's the same way in our spiritual life. We need those trusted friends to go, uh, to ask. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's just a friend in some other area. Hey, I'm having a difficult time in this area. Would you just check with me on that? Would you just give me observations on, on how I'm treating my wife in this way or, or how, how am I relating with my kids or the standards that I'm putting in place? Am I being legalistic or am I just being uh, not following the word of the Lord at all? Would you just give me some feedback? But if I genuinely do that, I have to really be humble because I might see something that is uh, convicting and shaming and it's like that banana that's been there that I've done for over and over, and I'm like, oh, really? But then you can actually get rid of it. You can clean your life up. You can, you can be free of that. You don't have to hide those blind spots anymore. So the question that Jesus wanted the Pharisees to wrestle with, and, and you to wrestle, and I to wrestle with this morning, is do you see clearly your blindness? And I would say, no, you probably don't. 
That's why you need some mirrors. But are you humble enough to, to look and to see? Well, the second thing that Jesus brings to the Pharisees is not just you're seeing blindly. He wants them to see something else. He wants them to see God's glory in all of this. Jesus asked the religious leaders, these, these people that their whole job is the Hebrew Old Testament, to memorize it, to talk about it, to teach it to others. They're the professors of the scriptures. And he comes to them and he asks them in verse 42, Have you never read in the scriptures? Have you never read in the scriptures? Do You see, he's, he's, he's poking at them. Come on. You know this. You know your face better than anyone else. But yet, there's a blind spot in there. Would you see? Of course they've read in the Scriptures. And then God goes on to quote from Psalms 118. He says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes. Jesus said, your rejection, your sin in no way thwarts the plans of God for your life and for other people's lives. What you thought you were, you were doing was good and is actually wrong, God's going to take that and he's going to bring it about for his glory. That stone that you threw out and thought, ah, this is nothing, is actually going to become the most important stone in the building of the temple in Jerusalem. What you intended for evil and harm and sin and even just your blindness and ignorance, God is going to use and shape and for his glory. Isn't that marvelous? It's the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous. God can take your worst situation, and he can turn it for his glory. That boyfriend or girlfriend that dumped you, and you thought, that's it, my world is shattered, when actually God has someone better in mind for you, someone to, to bring you to look more like his son. Your 401k all of a sudden went bankrupt. God's not going, oh, no, what am I supposed to do now? That was my whole plan to save you for your retirement. Oh, no, God's got a wonderful, marvelous plan for you. Can you see his glory in all of it? You get laid off of work. You have to switch schools next year, and you don't know if you'll have any friends. All of these things that you're like, oh, where's God at in all of this? And God's going, just look at my glory in all of this. I sent my son, and they rejected him, and on that, the whole world can rejoice. It's marvelous. He's using our sin and brokenness for his glory. So don't give up wherever you're at. Look and see. See, God's working on your behalf to turn things around for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Even the love of God when you're rejected. So Jesus wants us to see our own blindness, but also his glory and how he's weaving this amazing story. And the last thing is he wants you to clearly see the opportunity to respond. Jesus in his great patience and kindness doesn't want anyone to perish. So, so he often brings up multiple opportunities and conversations. He does with the Pharisees. Let, let me not just tell you one story. Let me tell you two stories. And let's interact. And let me point this out to you. I'm holding up a mirror. Would you respond to me? The religious elite, they're given these opportunities time and time again with Jesus. He gave them the prophets. He gave them John the Baptist to prepare the ways. Would you see? Would you be humble enough to look in the mirror and see? But they didn't believe. He talked with them. He set stories before them to help them see, but they just rejected him. Look in Matthew 21, the last part of it. It says, Jesus is telling uh, the Pharisees this, and even when you saw it, this mirror that I showed up to you and you, and you got it, this is me, you did not afterwards change your mind and believe him. You saw it. You had the opportunity to respond and you just hardened your heart. Uh, again, in verse 45, he says, When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. They saw, they understood, this is us. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. They, they saw correctly. They, they finally saw the mirror and the mirror and like, oh, that's my sin, that's my blind spot. But rather than humbly going, let's repent and turn to the Lord, they say, nope, let's justify, let's defend, let's 
harden our hearts. The Pharisees, in that moment of clarity, they, they could have seen and understood that the person that they were questioning was, was actually the standard by which should question them. They had the opportunity, the choice to respond. They could have turned away, pretending, uh, pretending they didn't see it. Well, I don't know who this Jesus was. I am just don't even want to be close to him. They could have rationalized or justified, hey, we've spent all our lives doing the right thing. We're right. Or they could have humbly turned to Jesus and repented and received forgiveness and freedom. So uh, thinking through this this week, uh, I've looked at all the situations around. The news is bombarded with what's going on. And I've seen myself in all this. Uh, I can look at those police officers in Minnesota and go, those evil, crooked men, how dare they? The wickedness that they sparked this fire that's burning all over the world, it's on them. I, I look at the, the looters and go, how dare they? These people who have been out of jobs and own businesses for two months with no money, and, and now they're looting? What evil, wicked people? And actually, I think I'm, I'm pretty good at judging other people. And, and this week, as I'm studying this, the Lord kept going, but what about you? What about your life? Are there, uh, are there times in your life where... Um, you come to somebody and you judge them right away and go, yeah, if you just work harder, you'd get off the street. And yet there's a, a laziness in me. There's, a, there's this insecurity in me that, that says, you got to work so hard to receive God's grace that somehow I deserve uh, having a home and a family and kids, that somehow that's on me. You know, I, I think during this time, it's so easy for all of us to look. Pulling an old switcheroo on you guys. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. See you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. 
high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. High and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, 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 we sing holy, 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 I want to see you. Holy, 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 we cry holy, 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 I want to see you. I want to see you. I want to see you. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of Thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for Thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my King. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from Thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mind would I withhold. Take my intellect and choose every power as you choose. Here am I, Here am I. all me. Take my, life. Take my life, it's all for thee, it's all for thee. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thy own, it shall be thy royal. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee.
it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first And sins I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me Shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Than when we first begun. Amen. So I have had a rough time this week. I've had a rough time this week um, knowing how to respond to everything that's going on. Like my heart has been heavy and um, so much hate and anger and, and violence going on. And it's like, what is happening? And uh, it wasn't until like Friday that I had uh, sort of a moment of clarity where um, I was listening to a sermon and uh, I'll just... <clears throat> it all kind of hit, and uh, it's like this is none of this is new. This has been going on for for centuries since since Adam and Eve. Um, this is our world. It's a it's a world full of broken and hurting people who are breaking and hurting people, and um, so it's a world full of sinners who are blind to our own sin. And so, um, I did it just hit like wow, we need Jesus very badly. We need him, we need him very badly. Um, on the cross, Jesus dealt with sin, and he's going to bring the world to justice. And that should bring, that should give us peace in times like this, where it feels like the world is, is just full of chaos, and it's, it's like, well, what, 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 what is going on? What are you going to do? And I, f- I, I forgot it this week. I was like, oh, wait, I don't have to be in anguish over this for too long. I can I can mourn with the people of the world, but there's something greater. There's a hope coming. We have hope in the resurrection. We have hope in, in Jesus coming and making everything new and taking the tears and the violence away. Taking the murder of the innocent and and um and making everything new. Paul writes in Ephesians. <coughs> Therefore, 
I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of, of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Will you pray with me? Father, you are over all. Great and amazing is your name. Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us your life, your life that sustains us daily. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Open our eyes to our sin. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the deceiver and his lies. For you are over all. Fill us with your peace. And Lord Jesus, come and come real soon. Amen. Go in peace and be people of peace. Have a great week.